This is Dan Rua, uh, CEO of Admiral. I, I want to welcome everyone uh, to the webinar, uh, 10 Things Top Publishers Are Doing to Prepare for Chrome's Ad Blocker. Um, the agenda for the webinar today, we've got a ton of material, so we're going to go kind of fast. Um, if you have questions, please ask them uh, in the question bar of the uh, GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, our agenda, we're going to do some quick panelist intros. Um, we're going to do some background and, and Q&A. Uh, that's really kind of uh, make sure everyone understands the terminology. Um, what are we talking about when we talk about better ads? What are we talking about when we're talking about the Chrome ad blocker? Uh, and then the, the meat of this is going to be the second half, which is what can publishers do to prepare and, and what are publishers doing to prepare? Uh, and so that will be Q&A with the panel. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with uh, potentially open Q&A, assuming we still have time. Uh, and uh, we'll take questions from the audience uh, for the panel. Uh, so just some real quick panelist intros. So myself, uh, as I mentioned, I'm the CEO of Admiral. Uh, Admiral helps publishers worldwide size and solve their ad block losses. Uh, so this is a topic near and dear to our hearts. Um, we're the largest in the category. We help over 12,000 publishers worldwide. Um, and we're excited to uh, be a part of this. Um, we actually uh, apply the better ad, better ad standard ourselves uh, in deciding which publishers um, we help. Um, and uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, Chuck Curran, if you could. Uh, give us a little background on yourself. Chuck is with us from the coalition. Yeah, hey, um, this is Chuck Curran. I've been uh, working as counsel to the coalition for the past year since the launch of the Better Ad Standards and uh, happy to uh, uh, walk you all through the thinking and the reasoning and how uh, you know the coalition hopes that these can make a difference uh, for consumers and, um, and also make a difference for publishers in terms of uh, uh, you know something that's useful for that dialogue with the consumer about whether or not uh, you are delivering a, a better ads experience. Terrific, thanks Chuck, thanks for joining us. Uh, Mike McLeod um, from PGA Tour, um, uh, you know, just really a top quality organization from a publishing standpoint, uh, they run a, a great business there. Mike, can you introduce yourself a bit? Yeah, Dan, Dan and Chuck and Max and everybody listening, glad to be with you today. Um, as Dan said, I work for the PGA Tour it's the premier uh, golf league um, on all the earth, as far as I consider. Um, and um, I'm responsible for the ad products that we put in our digital products. And then I also have a secondary responsibility for the dozen or so sort of SaaS platforms that we run in the background, um, Admiral being one of them, um, to help fulfill those advertising products. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, and then uh, as well, we have uh, Max Rybakov. He'll give you a little more detail. Investing Channel uh, has been a great partner of ours. Um, they also happen to uh, work with a, a large network of sites. And so it's a different perspective we wanted to bring to this webinar, not just managing a single site uh, with better ads, but how do you deal with a bunch? And so Max, uh, give us a little more background. Hi there. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so I'm Max Rubikoff. I kind of run products for Investing Channel. So we're a network of about 250 publishers. So anything in terms of from a perspective of rolling this out across a large network, we've had those problems. I can I can kind of get a little bit more insight into what that entails. Fantastic. Uh, thanks everyone for for the intros. And, and I did realize I, I didn't have the screen shared when I was uh, calling for questions a second ago. Uh, so again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask those through the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll get to those towards the end. Um, but let's start with some background. Um, and uh, so the first question here, before we even get to Chrome and Google and, and ad blocking, let, let's just talk about what is the Coalition for Better Ads? And so, uh, Chuck, if you could give us a little background there. So the Coalition is really uh, an attempt to get the perspective of um, you know, you know, all the different parts of the ecosystem around how to define um, uh, good and the bad uh, to get publishers, um, advertisers, agencies, ad tech, everybody to a common place where they understand and have a reference point for defining um, good and bad ad experiences. The, the coalition itself came together really with the goal, a couple, couple of different goals, one of which is to solve to the issue of how does, how does a publisher have a dialogue with a user who's 
using an ad blocker? What what can uh, you know be be said about having better ads? And how does how do we say this across industry? Um, and secondly, um, you know, how do we uh, you know it's it's not the responsibility of just one part or just publishers or, or just agencies to uh, to to solve to um, getting rid of the ad experiences that consumers say they dislike most. And, and the third um, kind of key point is we wanted something that's really done on a, on a good and objective methodology that really has strong consumer research to listen to the voice of the consumer so that we actually get data that um, solidly says on a, on a region by region basis, hey, you know, not all not all ad formats are bad, but there's some some that are are, are really uh, not only highly annoying, but also um, are really highly correlated with uh, with the desire by consumers to get ad blockers. So how do we how do we address those specific formats that the consumers dislike the most? Super, super. And then uh, I think that flows uh, very well into the next question, which is, what is the initial better ads standard? And and I have a screenshot on the right that shows the ads that are identified as, as kind of bad ads in the standard. I'd include, I, I'd uh, encourage others to kind of click the link and, and go on in to uh, see what those are in detail. But Chuck, talk us through the initial better ad standard. So really what the, what you're seeing is um, that this is the 12, 12, it's for mobile and desktop web. That's the, Those are the first two ad environments tested by the coalition using its research methodology. And um, that's not all the, the formats that were tested. These are the ones that, as I mentioned, wh which are the which are the formats that are most annoying and most likely to cause ad blocking. And these uh, really are the there's four uh, types of uh, desktop and uh, eight types of mobile web experiences that were at really beneath that standard of consumer acceptability. So uh, I just want to reiterate that point that um, the goal of the coalition is to encourage innovation, and you know most ads work for consumers. It's just a question of, well, which ones don't? And um, you can find out more on the website about um, the specifics of what was tested and behind this. But but the idea is that this is a common reference point for industry. Um, you know, so you as a publisher don't have to make it up and talking to an agency and say, look, you know, this just isn't isn't, you know, what the consumer is asking for. It's it's a bad ad format. It provides the standards provide that reference point for you and your dialogue. Uh, super. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I, I would share just, you know, Admiral's experience here. So Admiral is a member of the coalition. Uh, we're also a member of uh, the IAB, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, you know, one of the things we faced, so we had plenty of our publishers coming to us asking about this topic. Um, and we've had publishers coming to us that, that frankly had bad ad experiences. And we were making judgment calls on on whether to work with them and whether to help them um, based upon, you know, what their ad experience look like. And to be honest, you know, we don't really want to be in the business of having to make a bunch of judgment calls. And so, so this is an example of a standard that helps us um, be able to talk to our publishers and publishers who come to us and say, hey, listen, if uh, number one, we can help you um, kind of adhere to the better ad standard. And if you do that, uh, then we'd love to help you size and solve uh, your ad block losses. And uh, on that note, Chuck, I, I mean, I just maybe give you a minute to just you know, some publishers come to us confusing the Chrome ad blocker with the coalition standard. And, um, uh, you know, I don't know if you have a, a couple minutes on that topic. Sure. So, um, you know, as I said, these are these are um, standards uh, that are developed for the use of everybody in industry, and they were intended for multiple uses. And um, Dan's just mentioned one of them, that those of you who are publishers having dialogues with ad block users, you know, this is intended to provide a tool for you for that dialogue. Um, we've also, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, interest from the buy side in terms of, well, how do we how do we measure and reward, you know, basically for scoring purposes to recognize uh, the sites that are offering the higher quality experiences? How can you get positive benefits by by um, baselining? But obviously, uh, we have a, you know, sort of the elephant in the room that we have a big browser, big, uh, you know, a big browser company that's also uh, using these um, uh, uh, for these uh, initial standards to drive its analysis for um, uh, for a filtering application that it's just rolling out. And, um, you know, uh, here, um, what you'll hear about the program is working on, um, obviously, 
uh, you know, there may be multiple browsers that eventually adopt this. Uh, the coalition's focus is on, um, you know, having a uh, program, an industry program that uh, we hope to roll out very, very soon that will allow uh, for really the, uh, if there are disputes that come up over these kinds of issues for for a publisher or uh, or an ad provider to come to the coalition and go through a dispute resolution process so that uh, in effect we get the we get a, a orderly and kind of a, a predictable interpretation of the standard so it all makes sense and we don't end up with multiple different entities interpreting these things in different ways including Google so um, yeah. so there'll be more from the coalition super super thank you Chuck uh, next question um, really you know came to me as a uh, as, as Mike and I were, were uh, talking about things they've been doing, and, uh, and uh, Mike and I work together uh, on a mix of IAB topics, and, and he's, he's one of the most vocal publishers uh, in the IAB. Uh, and when we talked about getting ready for Chrome, uh, I thought he had good insights on how he was leveraging the IAB standards to help him get ready. So, so Mike, maybe you could comment just real quickly on, on you know what is kind of IAB lean ads and the new ad portfolio and how did that relate to you getting prepared for for Google? Sure. So before the Coalition um, for Better Ad Standards released their guidelines of the of the eleven or twelve or so formats that were were um, determined to be forbidden, um, the IAB had been working on some principles for well so for example the the coalition for better ads basically said you know these dozen formats are formats you shouldn't have but the IAB was working on something along the lines of a restaurant rating saying you know these ad experiences are an A these are a B you know they were trying to answer the question which ad experiences are better than others and kind of um, rank them and, you know, maybe develop a, an algorithm or a scoring system that then browsers and other entities could um, subscribe to. And basically with LEAN, what they were looking at was, um, you know, LEAN stands for light, encrypted, ad choice enabled, and non-invasive. And so um, light um, gets to the heart of how fast they are to load, encrypted, um, you know, are they being delivered securely, ad choice enabled, are the ads if they use data, um, is there a way a user can opt out of that data collection? And then I think the piece that really um, intersects with the coalition's work and then ultimately what, what Chrome and what Google decided to do was the non-invasive. And um, so there are guidelines in the new IB display ad guidelines. You know, I think it's on page 11. And so, you know, we joined the, the IB um, and we participated in the working group so that we could contribute and, you know, based on our experiences to, you know, how many files calls that we felt was acceptable when you're building an HTML5 creative. You know, what we were seeing in the industry is how many tracking pixels and, and how many other things were added to ads, you know, we're able to contribute to that. But what I'll say is that um, if you can, you know, join the IB, if you can get involved in the working groups, it helps give you information and, and give you more in-depth knowledge and, and can help inform how you make your own products. But even if you can't get involved, you know, really sort of reading through the material and trying to understand it. And if you don't understand it, asking your peers in the industry, posting um, to message forums is basically, you know, part of the part of the what I would say is that, you know, really get into the weeds with the documents as they're released and then try to work to understand them. Super, Mike. Uh, uh, thanks a ton. And, you know, at, at one level, I don't want to confuse folks with the IAB standard as we're about to roll into examples. Um, but I do think it's worth, you know, not only focusing on the better ad standard, because, you know, that is largely focused on specific ad units that were deemed intrusive, but there, there's other elements to ad experience that Lean uh, and the new ad portfolio tries to take into account. Uh, for example, how light the ads are that all publishers should be uh, paying attention to in addition to the better ad standards. So thanks a lot, Mike. 
Um, yeah, it's it's almost like on the highway, getting into an accident and making sure you're safe. You know, the chrome blocking and the better ad standards are how to stop a traffic accident. And then lean is about, well, how to make the ad experience as, as best it can be. Yep, super. All right, um, next few bullets, I'm probably just gonna uh, riff a little bit uh, for you. Um, as I mentioned, we, we do have a lot of content, so we're gonna go quickly. But you know, the next bullet is, what is the new Chrome ad blocker or filter? Um, you'll hear that term used, uh, either a blocker or a filter. Uh, in some ways, it's a little bit of both. Um, so Chrome implements the initial better ad standard, um, the, the, the bad ads that uh, Chuck talked about as being uh, created in that standard. They use that uh, to then score a site uh, on whether they have ads that are violating that standard. Um, if they do violate that standard uh, and they don't resolve that within 30 days, then they will block ads on that site and possibly other calls on the publisher's site with bad ads. Um, that's still to be determined. I, I'll get into that in a second. Um, the threshold for bad ads uh, right now uh, sounds like it's going to be about 7.5%. Um, and so a single bad ad is should not throw someone into uh, the penalty box. But uh, if 7.5% of your ads are, are uh, uh, violating, then uh, you're going to need to fix it. Um, and that will drop to about 2.5% over time. That's the guidance Google's provided so far. It's not clear if, if even that 2.5% will change over time. Uh, and then lastly, as I mentioned, um, you know, first they will flag it. Um, we'll get into the tools to notify you in a second. Uh, but if it's not corrected within 30 days, then uh, Chrome will take action and actually block uh, ads on your site. Uh, when is it being released? Uh, publicly stated release date is tomorrow. Um, and so, you know, no coincidence for this webinar time today. You also see tons of press floating out over the past week and, and even this morning, uh, Chrome gave the you know, most detail they've given so far on the Chromium blog um, that uh, is, is one of the links we share here uh, talking about uh, what it's gonna look like starting tomorrow. Uh, next question is what will get filtered? <clears throat> and uh, you know, I've really got kind of a two part answer to that. So kind of step one is that, uh, is what will get flagged? Uh, and what we get flagged again is, is those bad ads per the initial better ad standard. But then if those aren't remedied, then the question becomes what will get, what will get filtered from a publisher's site? Um, you know, again, bad ads, good ads, and more, it, it looks like all ads on a site will get blocked. Um, Chrome has integrated the ad blocker industries filter list, easy list, and easy privacy to execute blocking on sites that don't solve the problem. Um, you know, I think open questions that we still have, and we still wanna have more talks with Google on is, you know, what does that mean for filters and easy privacy that break things like site analytics? Um, you know, are they looking to implement everything that's in easy list and easy privacy or just some subset that they haven't made clear yet? Um, and what does it mean for filters and easy list that circumvent site copyright access control? So, um, Admiral, for example, offers copyright access control for publishers so they can protect their copyrighted content. Um, and uh, sometimes easy lists or easy privacy will try to circumvent publishers from doing that. Um, and it's not clear how Google will handle those entries uh, in easy lists and easy privacy. Um, next question, how will users be affected? Uh, just some user impact by the numbers. So Chrome worldwide market share is large, 66% uh, desktop. Uh, over half mobile. So starting tomorrow, you know, two thirds of desktop users uh, will have ad blocking built in. Um, Chrome versus other ad blockers, uh, IO, uh, who, who makes Adblock Plus, put out their own research on this. They claim that they block uh, 51 of the 55 tested ad types by Better Ads, and Chrome blocks uh, nine. Uh, again, there's this distinction between blocking and flagging that, that I think about. They may only flag nine ad types, but for sites that don't remedy the problem, it appears they will block all ads on those sites. Uh, and then three, uh, you know, it's uh, our take on it right now, we'll see what happens over time, is that it's unlikely that, you know, right now there's over 600 million devices worldwide blocking ads. 
it's unlikely they will abandon that, um, abandoning their ad blocker anytime soon. Um, but it's been stated publicly that uh, I think uh, Google hopes that it will at least slow the growth of ad block adoption. Um, how will publishers be affected? And we'll talk a lot more about this in the Q&A in a minute. Um, so Chrome announced so far that only about 1% of the first 100,000 sites that were scanned uh, were flagged. Um, so right now it doesn't look like a devastating impact. Um, we'll have more on Q&A. Plus today there was that Chromium blog post that's worth checking out. How will advertisers be affected? Um, the initial better ads and IAB lean ad standards provide more, immu more ammunition or fuse bad ad experiences. So, you know, there's a time when advertisers would come with, uh, you know, highly uh, disruptive or intrusive ad experiences because, you know, they wanted to get in front of that user and sites were forced to kind of make a judgment call and trying to push back on that. Um, these standards should at least help publishers um, point to the standard um, and stay within its uh, requirements. Um, panel, there is one question I have for you. Do, do you see this as kind of a major change or minor change in the type of conversations you'll be having with advertisers? I mean, from our perspective, I don't think so. Um, lean is so much more than better ads. I feel like from my personal experiences, advertisers just kind of haven't gotten there. They've taken as a recommendation, but um, it also kind of helps that we're, we're in the finance uh, space, so things get to us a little bit late. But they announced Lean, I want to say, like a little bit more than half a year ago. We had got a couple of questions about it, and I don't think advertisers really changed their creatives yet. So I, I think that's more important. And from the Better Ads perspective, a couple of those experiences are going to go away, but at the same thing, we're still getting those requests. Um, I don't, I don't see this being that significant of a change, at least not yet. Great. And I'm going to keep moving because we, we have taken so, a lot. Of hey, hey Dan. Yep. So just to, just to disagree a little bit yep. um, with Max, in the short term, the day-to-day -day execution of ads and working with advertisers won't change at all. Um, however, what I will say is I think long term, um, this really puts the so, you know, back when um, when iOS uh, nine was released and you could um, use content filtering to block ads in mobile and there was a big conversation around ad blocking. I think Chrome doing this really brings this as a as a hot topic of conversation. And when we start talking to advertisers about hey, um, your ad that you're giving us is, is too heavy, or hey, you've got an unsecure pixel, um, you know, we can lean back and, or we can fall back on, hey, you know, Chrome just blocked um, yeah. ads that are in violation. So it really does in the long term, I think, turn the conversation um, towards um, better quality ads um, overall. So I think in the long term, it makes a big impact, but in the short term, absolutely not. Super, super. All right. Um, and then uh, last one here on background is just where can you get in the weeds even more? So, you know, plenty of recent news links. We're going to send this to everyone after the presentation. Um, the ad experience report video is, is, is very, uh, very nicely done. Uh, and then if you wanted to dig into Chromium code just to see how they're using easy list and easy privacy, we've got links for that as well. Um, we are going to kind of shift into the next phase of the webinar. Um, and again, if you have a question, um, put it into the question box in the control panel. Um, we're going to move into panel Q&A. So what can publishers do to prepare? Um, topic one here is review the new ad standards. And so um, panel, I'd ask, what process did your team execute to review the ad standards? Was that one person that just went and took a look at things and kind of hacked it together? Did you have a committee? Did you have a process? Um, give me your thoughts. Sure, so to jump in, uh, for us it was a pretty simple review process. I mean, the better ad standards are actually pretty clear cut. Um, and again, from my, it's easy from my perspective just because I run the product team, so I'm very familiar with what experiences we have. Uh, yep. All three of us kind of got together with the, then our presented to our executive team, like, okay, 
these are the three things that, that were going to affect us. Um, after that, it just became a pretty simple, like, okay, great, now where do we have to remove them? Great. Yeah, and to echo, to echo uh, Max, that's exactly the same process. We, we got to get a few of us that are responsible for ad product, basically went through the formats. Um, and also, we did have a number of clarifying questions. Um, for example, you know, large sticky ads um, in the bottom were were flagged you know what does does that mean exactly um you know 30 percent of screen size and mobile is flagged what does that mean exactly so we did have a lot of clarifying questions to dig into um and then i will say also is that we really did dig into you know all of the um however many it was of the 200 ad experiences that were tested because um you know number one we want to make sure we understood um, what was going to be forbidden, um, but then also we wanted the research that was done to sort of guide our thinking about ad products overall going forward. And so, you know, number one, make sure our interstitial didn't get blocked. Okay, got it. Um, but then, you know, after that, to say, well, wait a minute, let's look at the stacked ranking and see what interstitial um, format or prestitial format ranked highest and let's you know see if we can you know try to achieve that as opposed to some of the the lower so we did go through our ad products and, and look at how they stacked up against the research and also quite frankly look at where we thought the research had holes and say well they didn't consider this but based on the principles we see here what you know what do we think that means um, so we did do quite a bit of digging into the details just help inform our future thinking. Great. And Chuck, Chuck here for the coalition. Um, we, we've had those same questions too about some of those formats, and um, we'll be publishing very soon um, some um, it, some tweaks to those uh, the, the language around the standard just to, to address because there are certain formats where there have been some common questions, and the coalition is certainly interested in being as clear as possible on what this what these standards cover. So nice. All right, next question, next topic is, you know, reviewing your site against those new ad standards, a little bit of overlap with the last discussion. Uh, and I was just curious, did, did you did you have any surprises? Um, and, and in particular, did, did, you, did your team have any kind of revenue projection adjustments because of the Chrome launch? Did you uh, expect revenue impacts that you then need to recover from with, with different units or something? Yeah, I mean, from from our perspective, uh, the biggest thing for us was obviously the pop-ups. Um, we we ran a fair amount of them beforehand, um, so we definitely had to kind of figure out a new a new solution to that. And I think actually, I have to say, after the initial surprise of kind of like not surprise, but you know, the shock of okay, Chrome's going to dictate you can't do A, B, and C. And when you start looking at the stand, it's really not that bad. Uh, so for in our instance, interstitials can be replaced with, you know, sticky units, uh, as long as not 30%. I think that's perfectly fair, really. Uh, I kind of get where they're coming from in terms of the interstitial being a bad user experience. So uh, great, I'm fine with that. Um, and just the fact that they've allowed pre-stitials and exit interstitials to remain, I think it's actually kind of made a pretty smooth transition. I guess that, that's kind of where I was coming from earlier when I say, I don't see this as kind of like a catastrophic, the sky is falling for publishers, you're, you're about to lose all of this revenue situation. Um, the one thing I will say, uh, for those of you who are going to then be trying to exactly find the definition of a pre-stitial, a post-stitial, an exit interstitial, Google has been a little bit less than transparent about how exactly they're going to be categorizing those. And that is one of the frustrations that we've experienced to the point where we've gone to the forums and kind of really had to d dig in deep with their, their, their moderators and their product people and even our own Google contacts to kind of get answers to these things. So uh, Chuck, I don't, I don't know if we, when you say that uh, the Better Ads Coalition is going to be releasing a little bit of clarification if that's going to be included. But uh, yeah, I think that's really the only the biggest problem we've had. Super. All right, um, next topic, check your Google ad experience report. Um, so, you know, obvious question, did you use the ad experience report? Was it helpful? Um, and then, you know, Mike, you, you know, you've got a handful of sites. Max, you've got a large set of sites. 
you know, how was it working with the ad experience report across that network? It, it was a little bit of a, of a pain. Um, we had to go in and manually configure it. Uh, for some of our sites, we weren't, we didn't have the proper permission set up from that, uh, that search console. Um, the best thing I would actually recommend for, for if there are any other networks out there who are trying to get a sense of what's going to be affected. So Google actually has an API that you can ping. Uh, it's going to return back all the sites that have been flagged, all the sites that, that have been, you know, tested. Uh, so if you're going to try to do like a quick once over to see if there are any immediate red flags, I would, I'd recommend starting with that. Yes, and just to echo that, um, one of the partners that we work with, um, one of the tr outsourced trafficking partners we work with actually um, proactively sent us a URL and its other customers and said, hey, we've programmed against the Google uh, ad experience APIs, and I don't know if there are more, um, Max, it sounds like something you did, and I don't know if there are more URLs or pages out there than the ones that, that our trafficking partner provided us, but, you know, I can hit a URL and I can see all of the um, pages that are flagged and whether they're pending or whether they're going to be blocked. Um, so like Max said, I think it's somewhat straightforward to create a simple uh, script that you ping the Google APIs and say, you know, here's my list of URLs. Where do they stand in the ad experience report? Or just to get, you know, a list of all the flag URLs and then just, you know, control F find to see if any of your domains are listed. Super. And in our follow-up materials, we'll also make sure there's a link to that info. Um, very good. Uh, and then what if some of your ads, ads are flagged? Um, and, uh, you know, did you have some ads that were flagged? Um, and then did you have to go through a process of kind of resubmission to Google? Um, and how did that work out? So we did have that um, kind of, I, 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 I kind of want to take a second to, I don't know, I, tell a little bit of a story from, from, from our perspective. Uh, so this is something that's coming out tomorrow, but because of the 30 day window, it's again, I just want to stress like for, for any publishers out there, if you're just now hearing about this and, and are concerned about everything being shut off tomorrow, more likely than not, that's not what's going to be happening. Uh, so just to take a step back, so when we were looking at the, through the API, which of our sites have been flagged, because we actually have a fairly standard uh, ad experience where really interstitials are the biggest thing. Out of a network about two, of about 200 sites, we only had three that were flagged as failing. So just, I just wanted to throw that out there because I think that was really the moment where we said, okay, we can take a deep breath. Um, and we, we've actually spoken to, to Google and they've kind of hinted at uh, this being something that they're going to be ramping up later throughout the year. But ever, just because I, I, I know from my experience, everybody's been reading about this February 15th date and, and kind of running around like, like chickens with their, um, and that's really not the case. Uh, so when our ads were flagged, I, I think it's the, one of the things that Google did pretty well to kind of handle the situation is that if it's the first time that your ad has been flagged, uh, you can go in say that adjust what, what the issue is and resubmit it. Uh, and then you're, you're, they're not going to block you immediately if that's the case. I think they say that they're gonna give you a grace period at that point uh, while the ad is being uh, reevaluated. And just again, based on my experience, it actually takes them a fair amount of time to reevaluate these things. I don't know if this was just a bug that they had uh, with their process prior to the launch of this thing. Um, but it, it's going to take a couple of days. Uh, there, there were a couple of publishers in the forums that, that I was looking through that have been complaining about them having resubmitted their ad, you know, like a month or two ago and not having gotten a response back. Uh, now, again, this was before the standard launched, so possibly this is going to change. But what the, what the forum uh, administrator said is that, great, if we're reevaluating, we're not going to be blocking your ads if this is kind of like your first offense until we get back to you. Um, so that, that was a little bit of a pain in terms of kind of having to hear back, uh, because of our use case, it was pretty straightforward that it was only one or two experiences that were, that were broken. It, it wasn't really that difficult to fix except for, you know, the lag time with Google. Super. All right. Next topic. Uh, what if none of your ads are flagged? I'm just curious, you know, once you're clean, um, or, or maybe you found you were clean, uh, and maybe Mike, you know, have you guys implemented a process of how you're thinking about this for ongoing review? 
We we do. Um, as I said before, um, we look at the lean standards and you know try from from the IAB you know and make sure that we're 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 living up to that. We have some creative scanning processes in place you know that are monitoring for CPU usage, total number of file requests, and those sort of things to improve the ad experience to make ads load faster. Um, and and like I said, long term is we're looking at you know. As we develop new ad products, we're looking at the Coalition for Better Ad Standards and looking at, at how those things were tested to figure out, well, hey, how can we, we produce the best experience? And then last, what I'll say is that, you know, right now, manually, we have a checklist of every Monday to go check the ad experience report um, just to make sure, you know, were we scanned recently, um, just to make sure we don't ha are flagged for any issues. Um, you know, once a week may be too much, and we hope to automate that soon. Um, but so, I, you know, I, I absolutely will say that this, you know, has helped us think about ad products uh, in a in a more, in a, it just simply in a better way. Um, and I think it's going to get everyone thinking about it in a better way. Okay. Nice. Uh, next topic: uh, Is there a dispute resolution process? Um, you know, is there any room for interpretation in the standard or what happens if you disagree with Google and does membership in the coalition you know, play any role in this? And so Chuck, this is a great one for you. I know you've talked about it before. I don't know how many details we have. Uh, what is the yeah, process uh, if you Google or other like, partners? Well, um, and just, um, just kind of distinguishing, um, we've got members in our coalition who are part of the sort of standards process, but we've been separately trying to roll out and uh, we're, we're rushing like everybody else uh, a, a program that um, will offer that dispute resolution that I mentioned you know opportunity to have an independent look about you know is it a pop-up or not or does it need is further tested needed to set up a, um, a, a a rational process for that um, you should be hearing from us very soon on that um, I think one of the um, interesting developments is that um, you know in recent months you know we just haven't had any predictability um, uh, in terms of how you know how much how many disputes we're going to need to get ready for, and um, you know it's our impression at this time that um, uh, as as we've heard from some of our publisher panelists um, that uh, the publishers are way ahead of this. That we don't um, we don't see a, a whole lot of controversy coming, but you know the, from the perspective of the coalition and the kind of the cross industry effort, we do want to have that backstop that uh, you know it's not just uh, one company's opinion. It's it's uh, you know to the extent these standards are being used, you have the you have the uh, the opinion and dispute resolution done by the entity that's issued them, which is the coalition. Super. So it sounds like more to come on that front, but but philosophically, that's what you're trying to get to to give give some yeah, resolution. Yeah, and, and, and just to be clear, the the mechanism we're talking about would be there would be if you can um, self-certify, one step that you could take as a publisher is you could join and step up and self-certify uh, that uh, you're going to um, ad 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 abide by the, the standards. And um, you'd have, as part of this program, you'd have access to this uh, dispute resolution mechanism if something came up. So um, you'd always have the option of not being part of the program and dealing with Google directly, but or you would have the option of being in the program and actually you know, deciding to champion the fact that you're 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 going to put yourself to an attestation of compliance and be able to tell your partners that, and also the uh, the ability to uh, um, to uh, get that uh, independent dispute resolution. Super, super. All right, next topic. Um, how will this impact the publishers' demand partners? Um, we kind of touched on this before, so I don't know if there's a lot to add. Have you already talked to your demand partners? And does, does this change your process at all going forward? Yeah, I feel like this was a pretty standard uh, question that we that we had. Um, we needed to make sure that that everything we're going to be running was going to be compliant. Uh, we had a fair amount of freedom, and actually, a lot of a lot of our demand demand partners from a direct and indirect side have been kind of like thinking, okay, great, this is going away. What what can I do to kind of replace it and, and keep the performance there? So. There's actually a lot of innovation going on from from a lot of different sides uh, to to come up with new, with new executions and you know kind of make sure that they adhere to to the better ad standard and and, and maybe a little bit the standard of lean uh, but I think that that's a separate issue. Okay, nice. 
All right, next question. Is this the end of, of high impact, disruptive, you know, creative ad units? Uh, any thoughts on that topic? Well, uh, <laughs> are ads supposed to be disruptive? Is that what we're trying to achieve here? Um, if you're, uh, or at least our point of view as a publisher, is that um, part of the effectiveness of an ad is that it's mixed with our content. You know, it's not enough to see, for the PGA Tour, it's not enough to see a Titleist ad. Um, you need to see a Titleist ad in conjunction with some of the best golfers in the world doing what they do best. Um, so, you, you know, we see the ad experience as trying to make it additive. Um, you know, if you're pursuing clicks and tricks, um, then hopefully this is the beginning of the end of that. But, um, you know, how do we, this begins a conversation of how do we make it good for consumers? Um, you know, I, I don't know if you've been, if anyone has been watching the Olympics, but, um, the Olympic ads are, are, are well done and they're, they're entertaining. So are the Super Bowl ads, you know, and how can we, um, you know, obviously those are the highest pinnacle of advertising, but how can we sort of, you know, try to imbibe that in our daily life? So, I mean, there should be high impact ads that aren't disruptive. Um, and hopefully this puts us on a path to, to get there, you know? Yep. Yep. Um, next question, uh, desktop versus mobile display versus video, you know, after you review and adjustments, do you find yourself you know, favoring any category of units over others to make up for lost revenue or, or it's just tweaks around the edges? I mean, I, I've always been a big fan of native ads. Um, I mean, I'll admit I'm a little bit biased just because uh, that, that's kind of a product I've been, I've been, I've been focusing on for, for a couple of years. Uh, that is definitely one of the primary recommendations we've been going out and talking to our salespeople about saying, hey, we know you're going to have a lot of advertisers who are going to want to see the performance that they've been accustomed to seeing. They're not us saying that great this for this uh, this format is going away doesn't really solve their problem. So I, I I kind of agree with Mike that you you don't have to be disruptive to be kind of high impact. The the way that question's a little bit formulated assumes that you have to be one to be the other, and I don't necessarily think that's the case. That there is a better way to do ads where you can have it work for both parties. A lot of the, th the things that I think the better ad standard is trying to get rid of were almost lazy. Uh, pop unders, for instance, like the, it's, it, I think we as kind of an industry should all probably agree that that is a terrible user experience that should just go away. Um, I think there are other ways to keep performance. So yeah, native is, is definitely a favorite of mine. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I will say that um, – so some changes that it really did push us in the direction of was um, we did really um, – we do still sell um, outstream units. Um, you now, the outstream units have to have to be in compliance with the Better Ed standards. They have to be in compliance with Lean. But we do, we do still have, if you go to our scoring pages, you know, once every 12 hours, um, and you can close it, and it doesn't auto start with sound, so it, it, it's completely in compliance. Um, we do, you know, in the middle of your um, browsing experience, you know, provide a video ad. And um, based on on what unfolded in the last few months, as a sales team, as an ad product team, we really did say, you know, we're going to take that ad format, even though it's allowed, um, and even though it tested okay, we're moving it from the menu to the back of the kitchen. I mean, we have it, and if you ask for it, we can provide it to you. But we really did then think about, well, what about skippable video? I mean, we're trying to, you know, put these outstream units here. Can we move them into um, into polite pre-roll skippable video? Can we uh, make that uh, video an in-banner experience that is not as disruptive as we think outstream video is? Um, so it really did sort of immediately uh, make us, you know, prioritize one ad experience over another. Terrific, terrific. 
All right, uh, we've only got about five more minutes here. Um, last uh, topic. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things we find in talking to publishers is there's so much attention to playing defense on this, you know, ma making sure that you're not hurt by the standards and you're not hurt by the Chrome ad blocker, that they, they often forget to think about, you know, is, is there an opportunity to play offense uh, and, and use these standards to actually come out better off than, than all of it? And so, uh, Admiral actually has an ongoing evergreen panel of ad blockers um, that, that we ask questions of every single week. Uh, and by the way, if, if any of you have questions you'd like to put uh, to an ad blocker, um, j just email us. We'd love to include it in, in one of our week's batches. And, uh, and, and one of the questions we asked in the last go round was, you know, the Coalition for Better Ads works with digital publishers and websites to set enforcement uh, for non-intrusive beneficial ad standards. Uh, would you be more likely to whitelist a website in your ad blocker if you knew the website adhered to the Coalition for Better Ads? Um, and, uh, you know, if you take out the 16% of people who, who didn't even think they had an ad blocker, um, three out of four ad blockers said that they'd be more likely to whitelist if engaged by CBA compliance sites. Um, and so, you know, at least the way we see the world, th this is an opportunity to play offense if a publisher has already done their work. Uh, to have a lean ad experience or a better ad experience to then communicate that with your users and get them to turn off their ad blockers as a result. And I'm just curious, um, uh, Mike and, um, and Max, you know, have you guys thought about this in, in an offensive way or are you doing any things to try to uh, benefit from, from these changes you're making? It, oh, and what oh, what I'll say it's it's not not necessarily so um, it it helps us in two ways and it's sort of an internal uh, business to business help not necessarily business to consumer um, when we work with our advertising partners um, the fact that we are compliant. And the fact that um, these standards ex exist helps gives us some leverage and help us start the conversation when we get creative that's not compliant. Um, so it absolutely helps in that way. And it also um, allows us, uh, when we're talking about ad formats and what works and what doesn't work, is it gives us some um, some sense of genuineness is that you know hey we're we're not disallowing this because of some arbitrary rule but we're disallowing this because we think it's going to be the best for advertising your brand um so it's more on an offensive side um in the on the in the business sense more so than than to the consumer um but you know when you're saying you know no to this big advertiser to that big advertiser or you're asking them to change their formats or they want it out stream but you're trying to work with them on skippable video i mean you can imagine um you know uh, an advertiser that used to run a 30 second pre-roll in mobile and now you're you're saying it needs to be 6 seconds or it needs to to skip at the five second mark, you, you know, is having that conversation, um, being involved in this process absolutely helps that a, a whole lot. Super. Max, have you guys thought about this at all? How to come out of this in a better position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, ad blockers or others? Yeah, I mean, uh, for us, this has kind of given us more of an internal incentive to push. Not, not so much the better ads uh, initiative, just because I think it's pretty clear cut. But the entire conversation about it focusing on the L in lean, light, light. Um, if you look at, I feel like most of the sites that cause high rates of ad blocking, it's because they are just terribly slow. And I think that's something as an industry that we've gone so far down the rabbit hole in terms of monetization uh, from a direct and indirect perspective that you have such complicated tech stacks, so many trackers going off a page. But if you go to some of these guys, some of these sites, um, it's going to take maybe 10 seconds to load before, you know, you can get content that's in a stable place that isn't jumping all around the page. That I think is the, is the biggest problem in the industry. And, you know, unfortunately, better ads doesn't, you know, Chrome didn't say that we're going to use the, the, the Google, what is it, the, the page insights tool and block ads on, on sites that are like, you know, they're ranking at like 30% out of 100. They, they didn't do that. So unfortunately, it's not really fixing the core issue in the industry from kind of how I see it. 
but we definitely have started using this as kind of a reasoning to go back out to all of our partners and say, hey, you know, whether it's you, whether it's us, whether it's how we work together, we need to really start thinking about how we're building an entire ad stack that is really going to, you know, start to look at the user experience. I think it's been something that's been coming for a while. Um, I think the lean recommendations have kind of helped guide the conversation there, but I think it's still really, honestly, at least a year. And I think that's optimistic until the industry starts tackling, you know, that, which I personally see as kind of like the core reasoning for, for, for user dissatisfaction with the experience. Great. Great. All right. So we are, we are at the end. Um, we, uh, we have about five minutes. We're not going to be able to uh, get to everyone's questions. Um, I do want to take at least one here. Let's see if anyone has a comment. So the question was, so if an ad block user does not turn off their respective ad blocker, does what Google is doing have any effect? Um, and I, I'll, I'll chat on that for a second. Anyone else wants to add color? So, you know, what I heard from the panel today is it definitely has effects across the ecosystem. So the ability to long-term improve ad experiences and get advertisers on the same page, uh, et cetera, it definitely helps move the ball on that front. Um, it's not necessarily driving users to turn off their ad blockers, but hopefully long-term there's, there's a benefit. Um, would that match how you guys see it or anything to add to this question? So the, the question is a technical one, right, Dan? It's asking that if I um, am using, um, I don't even want to say their names, but if I'm using one of the popular ad blockers, um, will I then also get the Google filtering message or will the Google filtering message be blocked? And I'll be honest with you, I don't, I, I guess I, I'm going to find out tomorrow. Um, but that, that's interesting but, because you would hope that they would get that message because maybe it would spur people to, to not use ad blockers. Yeah. I mean, am I All thinking right. about it the right way, Dan? Uh, I think so. And we'll add some more color in the follow-up to everyone. Um, I think there's a few different ways to tackle that question. Um, so uh, we are at the end, though. I, I want to thank uh, the panel for, for joining, joining us. It, really great content, Chuck. Mike, Max, um, I really appreciate your experience. I hope the publishers and uh, other attendees got a lot out of this. And attendees, thank you for joining us. Um, and, and the recording of this will go out, um, I think, automatically shortly after this. And then we will also send uh, follow-up links for, for added detail on everything we talked about today. So panel, thanks a ton. Thank yeah, you, thank you, Dan. Thanks, Dan. All right, everybody, have a great day today.